shotgun parsers, or how you can parse dangerous data better. Hello. <laughs> so, having figured out the uh, laptop connection and all that, uh, it's my, uh, I'm Sergey Bratis. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Meredith Patterson, who was the co-creator co of the uh, LangSec language theoretic security field of research, uh, and uh, TQ, who joined us uh, in that field. And we're going to talk today uh, about uh, what we call shotgun parsers, and that's obviously not a good thing. It's and about how to avoid them. So think of this pattern as uh, an annotated parse tree of your an annotated bin, uh, basic block tree of your code. Uh, some of those uh, dots are checks of uh, conditions that uh, hopefully presume, uh, hopefully uh, prevent your program from being exploited. Uh, some of those are your processing logic. And they're all interspersed. And uh, the name for this is a pwnage, because the unchecked um, processing logic uh, that makes assumptions that are simply not true uh, tends to compose into the exploitation. We're going to refer to design patterns a lot over the course of this talk. Um, and I just want to make clear that the shotgun parser pattern that we are referring to is emphatically an anti-pattern. Patterns that you should not be engaging in. Patterns that if you see, you should ferret out and destroy at your, your, at your earliest convenience. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to travel to the past, just like the beagle, uh, and uh, collect specimens of uh, famous bugs and show that, in fact, those bugs were caused by a shotgun approach to parsing. And uh, besides just collecting those wonderful finches, uh, we're going to uh, try to build a classification of uh, vulnerabilities that come from bad parsing uh, with a view of uh, constructing a better way of uh, parsing the data that you should really be afraid of, that you really don't trust, uh, that comes uh, from uh, an untrusted source or can be manipulated on the way. Now, the important thing about this is that for now, we're not making claims about how fast it can be. Uh, we're uh, talking about secure and possibly slow, but uh, hardened stack. Um, and again, we do not claim to know how to do that uh, in uh, uh, full scientific glory, but we're uh, really uh, constructing uh, something of a cladistics of uh, the parsing mistakes, of the parsing errors, and uh, we are going to present a few of them, and hopefully uh, the voyages will continue. So these are dispatches uh, from the um, uh, Langsec uh, ship Beagle. The examples that we're going to uh, take are quite complex software. Uh, and uh, this is not just um, uh, any garden variety software. It's a software that people uh, depended upon and still depend uh, quite a bit. And uh, even if, if in those uh, complex cases things went wrong, uh, we uh, must understand what, is, uh, what it was that went wrong and um, see where the uh, problem crept in. And uh, in each of those cases, we see that uh, a mistake was sort of inevitable uh, because the underlying data format was actually hard to parse. It required much context in order to parse it. And at some point that context was lost and uh, an assumption was taken uh, and that led to pwnage. So, just to recap uh, everything that Sergey and I have been talking about for roughly the last two years now. Uh, we strongly advocate full recognition of input before processing. This sounds simple, 
it's easy to fall off the wagon, but basically speaking, you have a recognizer which handles your input as a language. It treats the input as a language. If that input language is context free, such as JSON or YAML, then it is parsed with the proper context free grammar for that language. If it's something context sensitive, such as uh, you know, HTTP or uh, you know, DNS, um, then again, a suitable, uh, a, a suitable parsing automaton is used. Um, once recognition is complete, either the input is accepted or rejected, then you know, expectations can be enforced on the subsequent code via design by contract. Um, then, and only then, once we, you know, once all of your assertions have passed, I mean, you know, this is, this is, this is 00101, you know, then you can get, then you can safely process. And I've gone and forgotten to talk about all the different finches again, because I'm a terrible person. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, so the lesson from the finches here is that, um, they eat different things. They consume different protocols. They need to be different, you know, logically well separated components simply to make your engineering life easier. You know, because if, if you've somehow managed to intermingle, you know, different layers of a stack in a single piece of code, then you've introduced context that you, you know, that, that you didn't need. And you've only made your own life harder. This is why separation of concerns is a phrase. And this is, uh, 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 this is what you will get uh, if, um, well, again, oh, let's do the finches again. <laughs> so uh, for every kind of food, you have a special kind of a beak. They specialize. If the beak uh, would be uh, used on the wrong food, you will clog the intestines and your finch will go belly up or whatever the finches do. Uh, so you have to sort of bring the, wrong, uh, bring the right beak to the food or the right weapon to the fight. Uh, it does not do uh, to parse uh, something that is uh, context free with a finite state machine. We will see an example of that. In fact, uh, the recent Rails bugs were the example of that. Uh, there is a wonderful uh, bug that happened in 2010 and uh, was got the uh, pony for the most epic fail. Uh, and that was the anti-XSS uh, Internet Explorer uh, measure. Uh, in uh, applying a uh, finite state machine to rewriting HTML, which is actually worse than context free, uh, they actually got pages that were not vulnerable to XSS to be vulnerable to XSS. So the uh, principle that we're advocating is that you, uh, you, have, to, you have to bring the right recognizer uh, that matches uh, the input that you're consuming, or else uh, it's um, uh, bad news for your Finch. And by the way, the tool using Finch is real. <laughs> and there is really such a thing. Uh, I mean, the next stage would probably be uh, weapon holding Finch or weapon designing Finch. But in fact, um, you know, we'll keep you in suspense until uh, the last slide then. <laughs> we'll show you the Finch that, that probably tops the tool, tool using Finch. Anyhow, so we've seen this before. We've seen this over and over. The way, uh, this is the lulz boat, uh, which has come for so many sites and so many designers uh, in the course of the past few years. And uh, the reason why it came um, and made itself at home was that input uh, this, of this thing called input sanitization. So you have this myth that's ingrained in terminology uh, that there is bad stuff in input, but that's okay. You can suppress it. You can sanitize it. And this is entirely wrong. This is the root of all laws. This is the root of all pwnage that has been happening to PHP, for example. Because people are trying to uh, suppress bad stuff based on some kind of ideas of bad stuff. Oh, you know, we'll throw in an extra magic quote. Wonderful. Now you've created a vulnerability where none existed before. Uh, the point is that it's not about sanitization, it's about recognition. What makes your message valid is that it's uh, a phrase in a formal language 
and an automaton uh, should be brought to bear to recognize it. You have to have the right beak, you have to have the right uh, front end, you have to have the right recognizer, and uh, your correctness of your input. As the recent XKCD pointed out, I had 99 problems, then I used regular expressions, now I have 100 problems. <laughs> so, um, another variant of the same myth is that, oh, you can do escaping. Again, think about this. You're actually, your uh, correctness assumptions are in fact assumptions of a language, of a formal language. You, there is an automaton that should be able to recognize that formal language. If you treat escaping as just strings replacement, well, there are people who will take your code uh, and build a weird machine out of it uh, because, uh, you know, escaping is also computation. Escaping is also a kind of an automaton and uh, they will uh, find their way to construct uh, one such. Actually, I think the logo is a tentacle wrapping around the ruby. I just yeah. realized that. It's got a facet on it. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's ruby on rails. All right, so where it gets even worse than this is the idea that you can, you can just suppress bad things in both your input and your output, and that'll be just fine. So the problem here is that if you try to, uh, actually, yeah, so the, the Python user guide, believe it or not, has a great phrase for this. It's called changing horses midstream. So you know, they, they use this phrase uh, in, the, in the part of the user guide where they talk about um, operating, you know, operations on a list that work in place. Uh, delete being an example, and they warn you, you know, in the in the beginner's guide, don't ever delete things out of a list that you're iterating over, um, because you're going to, you know, you're going to end up in some sort of nasty runtime situation where you run off the end, and that's never supposed to happen in a language that manages memory for you, right? Well, but if you're doing that sort of thing in place, that's the problem. And similarly, if you're trying to, at the same time, mung your input and your output, you're going to introduce weird machines. So XSS has been a source of those because, yeah, you know, you're protecting, uh, you're reading in the page source and then you're trying to modify that uh, so that the user is somehow made aware of the XSS or you somehow break the XSS. And this just is such a source of the halting problem. It's uh, just can be done. So, uh, we promised you finches, but in fact, <laughs> let's start with a pony. Uh, IE8 deployed this uh, system for breaking uh, standard uh, idioms used in XSS. Uh, so, they would uh, take an object or a link or an iframe uh, and insert an extra uh, character. If uh, the, uh, uh, if the uh, idiom uh, looked like it was indeed uh, evil XSS. And what they did was they uh, took a regexp, and you can actually see examples of such, some of those regexps, and then they applied them to server responses. And the problem was that you could actually craft the input in such a way that being non-vulnerable to XSS, it became vulnerable. And this is the paper that uh, actually has uh, a demo online uh, and uh, it's just awesome. And then the Google, of course, saved the day uh, by introducing this new header, XSS protection zero, meaning please, please don't protect me. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's really the reaction that you should uh, experience uh, when you're seeing a reg exp uh, being applied to uh, that fight. Uh, it's uh, a different, it's a m much richer language, uh, class language. Uh, you can just not handle it with finite state machines. So substitution, uh, such as uh, what the reg exp does, is actually computation. If you find a component that will do it repeatedly for you, you can actually get uh, up to the Turing machine power of a computation. So, um, uh, watch Mario Heinrich. 
uh, he's got your nose talk or uh, his paper called uh, Stealing the Cake Without Touching the Sill, actually showed that uh, using the password manager that would continually provide, um, uh, try a password, uh, try to fill it in uh, into the uh, web form. And he managed to uh, use that for a loop. He managed to use the SVG elements uh, rendered conditionally for bringing the if, and suddenly you had quite complex computations in your browser. But, you know, things get better. <laughs> so everybody is probably well familiar with the Ruby on Rails, or the spat of Ruby on Rails vulnerabilities that's been coming out over the last couple uh, weeks and slash or months. Um, this, or in particular, um, CV 2013-0333, um, which is the YAML, or the JSON parsing bug that was really a YAML parsing bug. <laughs> um, so, the, or to quote the, uh, be, or the best description of it that I'm seeing, that I've, or the, uh, Proof of con the description of the proof of concept for this bug. Um, basically, um, they had a they had the problem that they needed to parse JSON, and they had this good, perfectly good YAML problem. So they used the mathematician solution, which which is to reduce the problem solve of parsing JSON to the problem of parsing YAML. And they did so by running a bunch of regexes on it, um, and they looked at the parts of the JSON syntax that were not in YAML and changed them to the equivalent YAML forms, but didn't think about the bits of YAML that weren't in JSON. And so, um, the, uh, sorry, I haven't spent too much time looking at these slides. <laughs> um, so, the, er, The thing is that they could have, or they could have just used a JSON parser. Um, these things exist for uh, Ruby. They're, um, and they parse exactly the syntax that is JSON. Um, and there would have been no bug. But instead, they had to, or they bolted on top of the Rails, so the Ruby serialization to YAML, and had a problem. Um, in particular. Um, there's this particular, or YAML has this particular syntax feature of having tags, and, which are in Ruby, treated as functions to call to um, process, or to convert a um, data structure into some Ruby object. So what they were actually doing here was they were not parsing JSON and transforming it into YAML. They were, what they were parsing was some bizarre hybrid of, of JSON and YAML because, you know, this, this dash, dash, dash and the, the, the hash, uh, what the hell is that thing called again? Da er. I don't sodding speak Ruby. Um. But yeah, no, I mean, all, all, that business, all that business at the beginning is not actually valid JSON. Um, it is valid YAML and the, uh, and the convert JSON to YAML method simply allows it to be parsed as YAML. Which makes no sense. You're not supposed to be parsing YAML. You're supposed to be parsing JSON. Um, but because you're able to simply leverage YAML straight into uh, into this method, um, you're able to you're able to use that to represent any sort of object that Ruby lets you represent in YAML, which is to say anything. Yeah. So. Um, now, hopefully, we've convinced you that. Uh, the mismatch between the uh, language of the data format and the language of uh, the language that your actual parser is capable of checking, capable of recognizing, uh, is a bad thing. And uh, with uh, the uh, Rails uh, bug, I mean, we can describe it in just one word. Uh, instead of recognition, they did rewriting, and then are uh, not exactly recognition. And then uh, parsing uh, that somehow assumed that in the process of rewriting, the um, uh, 
code was, the, the input was already checked. That's really the worst way to go about it. But, uh, you know, from those, and basically uh, that's when your uh, Finch is dead. You apply the wrong uh, sort of processing and uh, it's got us clogged and there you go. But, in fact, let's look at very, very angry Finches. Uh, at extremely impactful bugs that seem to do the right thing. And now we're talking C, right? Uh, it's uh, a little bit puzzling how people manage to uh, shoot themselves on the foot with managed languages, but here is a C that uh, um, makes malloc, mallocing while you are parsing, uh, such a damn big deal, because you are allocating memory and you're copying uh, bytes, and you can construct, uh, that's, that's already enough for construction of an exploit. So the three examples are going to be OpenSSH pre-auth uh, challenge response, a bug that gave uh, remote code execution, uh, pre-auth. Uh, this was done by Goebbels in 2002. Uh, bind, of course, was the mother of all uh, problems for quite a while, so it's an older bug, it's uh, 1999, and that's the next record buffer overflow. And again, we're going to talk about how that happened and how it should not have happened. We are going to present a, a tool, a parser constructor, uh, that uh, allows you to bypass uh, those two, av avoid those kind of subtle bugs. In C. In C. So, uh, and uh, finally, uh, we're going to look at the famous uh, OpenBSD uh, remote IPv6, uh, ICMPv6, and buff overflow, which again uh, gave remote code execution on BSD boxes. And that was in 2007. And then again, we'll talk about why and how to avoid this. So, you treat your data format as a language, and the thing about it is that uh, if your assumptions made by the code about your C data structures are connected to what makes a proper phrase in this language. Well, treat it as such. Apply recognition. And if you have context sensitivity, if you have multiple fields that must agree in value uh, for your input to be correct, uh, never forget to check that. More to the point, um, if you describe your inputs uh, formally, it becomes easier to validate those relationships between elements because uh, when you're no longer thinking about, oh God, I have to make sure that this value and the length of the thing that this pointer is pointing to are the same and I have to check all these other things in all these other places, you can describe these validation relationships um, in, a much, in a much more structured and principled way that actually expresses the relationships between, um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, a, a a parser and a sub-parser, which we'll actually see an example of in just a, in just a moment here. Um, but basically, you know, the overall idea here is just to make the code that you're writing look a lot more like the spec that you have written down, even if it's just in your head. Yeah, so here is this uh, challenge response bug in a sub-parser of that particular phrase of uh, SSH uh, authentic challenge response authentication options. And uh, this is what the code looks like. And this looks really simple, right? I mean, this look, this, the, how could this possibly bite you? Well, let, let's walk through it. Uh, so the very first thing that happens is uh, we pull four bytes off of the incoming packet. That's, you know, 32-bit integer. If that number is greater than zero, that looks like a sanity check, right? Fine, wonderful. Um, then we start, uh, yeah, we, then we start allocating space uh, for, for a bunch of strings. Uh, which are effectively C string, uh, sorry, excuse me, effectively Pascal style strings, uh, which is to say a length and then that many bytes. Um, but what happens, anybody, uh, if the NRESP value is uh, larger than 2 to the 30, 2 to the 30th? Exactly. Yeah, so that overflows. So let me just walk you through the entire exploit really quickly. Um, so there's the packet get string uh, that gets called there. I mean that's that's normal. Um, so a buffer. Yeah. You know, so sorry. The, so packet get string calls buffer get string, which start which pulls the fur which starts pulling um, 
she starts pulling strings off of the uh, the packet that was sent. Uh, these strings, by the way, uh, are shell code just uh, putting itself into uh, the uh, into the area off of the end of the array that you've already run into. Because you know, if if you if you overflow it to where you've just malloced four bytes, cool. Now you're allocating that. Now you're allocating lots of space for st for strings full of shell code. Uh, so that when you bounce into so that when you bounce into fatal, because you deliberately put a, a packet that was too long, so that meant that uh, the that meant that it choked uh, and, and said nope, we're we're not going to take this. It looks too big. We get, we fall into the execution handler, and because we laid down all that shell code earlier, we stomped on the on the function pointer that gets called on the context of um, of the packet and. The pointer gets dereferenced, and you win. <laughs> that's where you're, that, that, that's how that's how you end up getting your shellcode called. Um, so how do we do this right? So this is uh, one of the two uh, idioms essentially for expressing uh, a parser in Hammer. And so how would we express this? An int followed by that many strings uh, that are specified by length and value. Well, first we read an unsigned int, 32 bits. Then we read. Uh, uh, so then we start reading. Uh, I'm sorry, th uh, that should have been h many h length value. I'm terribly sorry for that typo, guys. Uh, <laughs> see, I'm sorry. No, I'm. I'm uh, yeah, so, no, it's, I'm, so basic. Or, ba I wrote that wrong. Basically, what what is going on is that you have or you read an int, and then you read that many strings, each consisting of an int and then that many bytes. Thank you, dear. Yeah, that, my, my, my indentation screwed me up. Uh, I totally bought that one, sorry. Anyway, point being, when you see what looks like a special case, um, check your premises and figure out which one is about to bite you in the ass. Um, because either your input data language has some quirks, in which case that's okay, just you know, d define that formally. Or you're digging around with you're digging around into and out of your syntax semantics boundary, which is what happened here. You were using an unchecked result, which w you know, which was semantically derived, right? You got this value out of it, you extracted this value out of your syntax. Now it's semantics. Um, then you apply an operator to it. It overflows. Um, you still didn't check it, and so that's why your logic is bad. That's your premise where you screwed it up. So you could put it differently, right? Again, uh, look at this code. It starts allocating memory and copying bytes. Uh, that's what packet get string does. Uh, while the packet is not yet traversed, this function would error out if uh, the packet is not entirely consumed and the length value options uh, are not uh, taking up all the packet, but it's too late. Because we never actually get there because, the, you know, because, a, because a string that claims to be too long for the, uh, for, for the implementation causes the call to fatal. And so that's how we get out of that loop. And so the recognition is uh, never completed. In fact, your recognizer is hijacked, uh, such as you have it, your parser is hijacked uh, from uh, under you. Instead, you should be writing it like this, uh, specifying exactly what is it that you expect, what is followed by what, and uh, exactly where the packet needs to end, right? Uh, this is the parser. This is also the spec. This is the way to do it. Uh, and uh, Hammer, the parser construction kit, uh, that uh, Meredith and TQ are working on uh, lets you do this a specification based parsing uh, with, with uh, what is essentially parser combinators, but we're not going to say that in C. No, I will go ahead and say it. I mean, it's a way of writing inline domain specific languages in C. So let's, uh, and uh, that would have uh, saved that particular sub parser from being exploited. Um, Let's look at another bug, which is bind uh, 8.2. Uh, when uh, bind introduced this a special kind of a record called NXT uh, to say uh, to the requesting uh, client that, you know what, there is no name 
like this, but how do you represent uh, a negative? Well, uh, the way you do this is uh, you're saying, okay, between this name and that name, there are no names. So uh, that gave you basically, the response gave you basically a pair of names saying that, no, that range is unpopulated, uh, be warned. And uh, this has gone through a couple of updates. Uh, the way that exploited uh, uh, servers uh, via a bug in the target uh, name server, uh, the uh, target uh, parsed the uh, NXT record and got owned, uh, was actually quite interesting in that the target was the name server and an exploited name server redirected to uh, uh, another one which um, uh, in a recursive lookup which uh, delivered uh, the uh, payload uh, to the target and the target dropped uh, the shell. And uh, we uh, found uh, that code. It's, it turned out to be uh, sort of buried in various repositories, but uh, we have an, we'll, we'll have an annotated version of it online. Um, and this, is, this was the ADM crew uh, that uh, exploited that. So in order to see how that went wrong, we should understand the DNS format first. The thing about the DNS format is that it consists of these RRs, resource records, uh, which follow the header, and those RRs do what they call compression of domain names. And the compression is really just back referencing of uh, the previously occurring strings in the packets. So if you need to uh, replicate a bunch of names, you don't, in fact, replicate them. You instead say, okay, look this far back into the packet. And uh, you will find uh, that string uh, ending with, uh, uh, with for, for, the, for this, uh, for this uh, long, uh, for, 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 the, for this span. And so what this means from the point of view of, of parsing RRs is that you have to keep track of every RR and every name just to know how long your names are. This is very context sensitive. And uh, this is, of course, every time you see a length field in the data format of, and you know, here is your typical RR, and here is your R data uh, that was, uh, here is your data that was described by this length uh, with uh, the next uh, domain name uh, in the NXT record. But every time, uh, you see a length field, you should be worried, especially if those length fields have to agree with each other over the span of the packet that you're parsing. So when you have a shotgun parser, uh, Mr. Length Field is no longer your friend. So the domain name is compressed. It can only be checked after uh, all the names have been expanded, so you need to keep all that context. And so you see code like this. All right. So, it starts out uh, with the uh, compressed domain name being expanded, that's in line two. Um, where things actually start to go wrong uh, is down in line 13, where um, you see that we've, uh, yeah, we've, we've got, a, well, 12 and 13. So, we increment the position of the, uh, of the current character pointer, CP, uh, where, the, you know, where the compressed data starts. Um, by the length of the expanded domain name, which is kind of odd. Why don't you continue with that? Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, remember, you have all of those RRs, your, your previous packet, and the lengths uh, sum up. So, in order to have the, in order to have the, uh, um, enough of a buffer, and to do memory copies of those names properly, uh, you start uh, depending on uh, uh, the lengths in RR uh, records. I, honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion at this point that if you're dealing with offsets like this, that's actually a code smell. I mean, like everybody knows, the two hard problems in computer science are cache invalidation, distributed naming, and off by one errors. So. Yeah, and uh, you know, you look back, uh, so basically you look back in the packet, right, and uh, you uh, uh, derive the string length of what you had back there, and then uh, you copy memory, and this is where uh, the crafted uh, uh, strings 
in the previous uh, RRs bite you and you overflow the buffer. Why should anyone have to be doing arithmetic in order to parse things? Yeah, uh, we should, uh, we should, we should well, probably put this on another one of those slogans. <laughs> so, as Sergey said, if you're having to keep track of the semantics of, you know, of things like length fields across an entire span of data are just not safe. Um, you run into see you run into similar kinds of, uh, of allocation errors as what we ran into before. So now I want to talk about how we do this in Hammer with the other API that was actually just recently pulled in uh, thanks to a pull request sent by Sven Halberg, the greatest user ever. Um, so you'll notice that the syntax looks a little bit different here. We've got uh, and we've got a parser called the knit character string. Um, but what's that doing here? Actually, that's a function that returns a, that, that returns a parser, and that top one is static. Um, I'll buy a beer for anybody who can tell me what that design pattern's called. Really? No. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bear in mind, like I, I don't actually do security for a living these days. I work in, I, I, I work in engineering. I'm slogging in the trenches, just working with people that sling C and Java day to day. So maybe my expectations have changed a little bit. But yes, that's called a singleton. And the reason why we're using this is because, um, and this is actually in the repo right now. If you go to GitHub.co, oh my God, we're totally out of time. <laughs> Shit. All right. Well. I'll go through this quickly then. So we create a singleton. Now we've got, uh, you'll notice these macros here, HA rule. So we've got, a, we've got a family of macros that PESCO came up with uh, for constructing rules with validation, rules by themselves, rules with actions attached to them, and rules with everything. So here what we're doing is we make sure that that singleton exists and we're attaching a rule to it uh, that I'm not actually going to show you, uh, because what I am going to show you is the rule that uh, the macro is going to expect to uh, apply to this text record and process it. And this is all it is. I mean, this is, the, this is just about the same length as the, as the previous code. Um, it's a, the, the backend API for extracting stuff out of uh, for extracting stuff out of parsers is a little messy, but I'm more than happy to introduce everybody to it later, and we're working on docs. But notice what it doesn't have. It doesn't have arithmetic. It doesn't have mallocs that take the arithmetic uh, that you do on the input data. You w you do see some mallocs there, but what you're seeing there are actually mallocs off of an arena allocator, uh, which TQ wrote me for my birthday last year, uh, so that we could make this thread safe and re-enter it. Uh, and uh, the important thing about such malics is that you can discard them uh, safely without having them hijack your parse. So uh, we are uh, running low on time, so we are going to uh, rush through the uh, OpenBSD kernel mbuff overflow, which uh, was completely amazing. Uh, I maintain that this is one of the uh, absolutely stellar bugs. And, you know, as, as angry finches go, this is the one that really, really bites you. Um, so, <laughs> yes. so, so um, it was found by uh, core security, uh, by Artega and Guerra, who presented that in April uh, 2007. Uh, and uh, there was a, a Black Hat talk uh, on it and a DEF CON talk. And uh, it's just, uh, it exploits the fact that the um, IPv6 as a uh, protocol is a chain of uh, is, is a chain of these extension headers, uh, which can vary in size, and uh, it's just strewn with length fields, uh, the length field uh, or the uh, next header field uh, that. Uh, identifies the next header and the next header and the next header. The funny thing is that you can uh, mix and match those headers, especially when doing fragmentation, excuse me, fragmentation, in interesting ways. So uh, this is your typical IPv6 uh, packet header, and uh, this uh, upper layer header, uh, this uh, next header, uh, which eventually goes to you know, your TCP or UDP, locates the next header in the record, and then the next one, and then the next one. So you have this chain. 
And this chain is mapped into uh, OpenBSDs, packet fragment allocation. The packet fragments are stored in structures called MBUFFs. Those MBUFFs are chunks of the packet, and you can have a chunk of the packet that either stores the packet or uh, sends off to another buffer. Interestingly enough, it can also contain a function pointer to what you need to, uh, uh, to the function that you need uh, to call to clean off, uh, to, to clean up the packet uh, from a buffer. Uh, that pointer gets overwritten. But what happens there is that you have two chain structures, right, two chain languages, and they are stored uh, in this chain of uh, MBUFFs. When the languages do not align, when the offsets do not align, things get really interesting in that you can overflow the uh, MBUFFs by mixing the right uh, set of fragments in uh, the input. It's very context sensitive and it was not handled right. So this was the function where the problem occurred. Uh, it's called M pull down. What that function does is it... Yep. Yep. We, or what I'm saying is we don't have time to have yes. this. Yes, yeah, we don't, uh, so again, what this function does is it reallocates uh, the uh, fragments of the, uh, the, the packet across several fragments when you need to get one uh, span of it for actual parsing. So it continually changes the chunks from under the uh, packet. It's uh, what, what, and you know, this is the, this is the story. But the reason why the story is there is, oh my God, 451 lines omitted in that function? This is a code smell. This has a name. This has a name on antipatterns.org and its name is taller than me. <laughs> so bear in mind, you know, a code smell does not absolutely guarantee that something is wrong in your code, but nine times out of 10, when, when you see something that just looks freaking funny, that's, that's gonna be a sign that, you know, look deeper. Um, because when you have just too much stuff going on in one function, sometimes you are violating separation of concerns. You know, a, a function should do one thing and should do it well. What they were trying to do was to keep all of the operations in a method at the same level of, of abstraction. They're assuming one layer of the network stack is a layer of abstraction, but syntax and semantics are different layers. Sometimes pieces of parsers are different layers. You know, it all depends on what languages you're using, what protocols you're using, and how they compose together. Um, I'm gonna skip this stuff about offset, offsets because we really don't have time. Um, but I just wanna point out another anti-pattern here. So you notice how like, uh, the way that they fixed this bug actually just increases the indentation here. It's just more freaking special cases. Thanks, guys. Um, this is another anti-pattern. Um, when, you're, when you're saying, you know, if, if, if all these things, you are setting yourself up for a special case that you didn't catch. And there it is right there in the code. But here's where things get a little messy. We have one more Finch to introduce you to. Oh, well. So, story time. Um, and this, we'll keep it a short story because we're right, right about out of time, but um, first we'll step back a couple years to 1972. Um, I wasn't born. Neither was I. This is, or the internet was not really that much of a thing back then. Um, <laughs> so, um, there was an operating system called 10X um, that was descended, or it was the unofficial official operating, it was one of the unofficial official operating systems for the PDP-10. Um, built on top of TOPS-10, the context of it is fairly unimportant. Um, the important bit is that um, there was a, or the way that you checked passwords on it to do authentication is you called a kernel function um, that looked vaguely like this. Originally it was written in PDP-10 assembly and um, it did PDP-10 assembly like things like passing around length fields as part of the pointer. Um, so this is idiom idiomatically translated to C. Um, so 
obviously there's a there's a vulnerability here where you could just pass in a password that's not null terminated. You can stomp over, or you can walk on arbitrary, or you can touch arbitrary memory. Um, however, there is also an exploit um, that is much more subtle that comes from what happens if you put the password that you pass in just off of a page boundary, where the second page where the rest of the password is is either on slow disk or even slower tape, or not even there at all. Um, so what happens is it checks, or it checks the first character, it's like, oh, that, that's valid, and goes on to the second character and cause, causes a cache miss, which takes an enormous amount of time. Um, or if the first character is invalid, it returns immediately. Um, and so you've got a nice timing oracle to produce your password cracking attempts to um, roughly milliseconds. So, I mean, the, the, the scary thing here, and this is why this guy's the vampire finch, is because, you know, Hammer's not going to save you here. You know, it, it's not operating at the level of, you know, at, at, at the level of page boundaries, apart from, you know, what we did with the arena allocator. Right. Oh, it's worth mentioning that there's a weird machine there. And unlike most of the weird machines that we've been looking at, this is not a very complex weird machine. This is a regular weird machine. Um, but the point is that it's still functionality that emerged from two systems being composed together, which is to say the page fault handler and the password uh, and, and the password routine, um, they composed together into a, you know, into a state machine that did not exist before. And uh, this is really what you want to avoid uh, when you're dealing uh, with your parsing. You don't want to expose uh, uh, arithmetic and memory allocation and copying. Uh, before you are sure what it is that you are allocating and copying. And essentially your parser should derive from the specification or in case of Hammer, Hammer allows you to actually write the parser as a specification. Then you should avoid uh, doing any arithmetic in the recognizer. The recognizer is uh, not a good place for it. You should avoid uh, complex systems of offsets and complex alignments of one structure that's chained over another structure that's chained. And that's heaps. That's why you need special protected arenas for uh, parsing, which again, uh, Hammer uh, gives you. And then, of course, you know, here's the vampire finch. Uh, there is blood in its beak. You're still not quite safe. Uh, there are still timing attacks uh, and uh, architecture that will get you. But at least it won't be from uh, a memory corruption. So, the takeaway. As we've been saying all along, please, what you are saying, you know, what your users are saying to your application, what other people's machines are saying to your machine, you know, these are all languages. Please treat them that way. Please try not to use context-sensitive data formats if you can get away with it, because we've just seen some pretty gruesome examples of just how much root shell doing that can get you. you know? But at the same time, also, if you're going to be operating on a context-free language, operate on it as a context-free language, not a regular language. Um, We've been taught, you know, I, I've been bringing in design patterns uh, into, this ta into this discussion because I think this is a conversation that we really need to be having with engineers who are not necessarily security people because that's their language, that's their idiom, that's what they know how to speak. You know, and we can also talk about data patterns. Uh, we're, we're talking about establishing data languages, specifying them in line and, you know, just using them as part of your code. It's not a separate thing, you just write them the same damn way you do everything else but as, an, you know, as a component, it is a separate piece. It takes care of itself, and you make sure that you can compose it neatly with other parts of your code. Or else other people will compose it for you on your machine. Um, we should open up for questions. Yeah, questions? The owls are not what they seem. <laughs> Anything else? 
I, 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 there, I see a hand. Okay, in the front row. Uh, do you have an opinion of antler? Yeah, so I like antler. If you're using Java, go ahead and friggin' use antler. Um, it, uh, as I recall, it just had a really nice new rev. Java or any of the other dozens of languages that Antler supports? Uh, the problem with Java, of course, is that it serializes and then it deserializes. And uh, as the recent uh, spate of O-Days has shown us, it doesn't quite do it right. But at the application layer, absolutely. Antler, Antler rocks. Totally go with it. Antler's great. I love it. Anybody else? I know. Yes, again. Yeah, yeah, no, if you're, if you're like, if you're writing up a, if you're writing up a specification of a language, BNF is totally the way to go. Um, you know, the RFC 5234 um, is the RFC, is the RFC definition of the advanced Bacchus NOR format, which was designed to be able to describe pretty much everything that you might want to be able to cram into a protocol. There are some exceptions. The comment field is a problem. But by and large, RFC 5234 is actually self-describing, which is kind of neat. Like if you implemented a parser for the ABNF in RFC 5234, you could parse all of RFC 5234 with it. But in reality, you know, you, find, you will find yourself writing simple sub-parsers for things like uh, type length value or length value? Yeah, well, I mean, like, you know, the DNS example that's actually sitting in the Hammer repo uh, right now is, a, is, I like to think, at least a pretty nice example of that um, because, you know, it abstracts common functionality that both resource records and, like, the rest of DNS use. Resource records are sort of abstracted off into their own little module, um, and the rest of DNS is too, and it just, it, it, we're building towards a standard library, like a reference library of protocol and message format implementations so that nobody has to sodding well do this anymore themselves. Um, and DNS was our first step. So we're working on that. Uh, and I should uh, again stress that this is in C, <laughs> right? You can get uh, nifty academic parser generators. We'll be happy to provide you a bibliography uh, in Haskell and uh, other Scala and other languages, but uh, you really are down to, when you're parsing packets, you're really down to parsing C. And you know, the other thing that we did uh, with Hammer that uh, I keep forgetting to bring up that actually no other uh, parser generator library out there does is Hammer is bit oriented. Yes, you can, conv you can comfortably and conveniently parse single bit flags uh, you know, out, of, out of byte oriented data and it doesn't hurt. So, we should do it like that. Use Hammer! <laughs> the other thing that is worth bringing up about uh, Hammer is that um, it supports, well, kind of at this point, but it will support soon, uh, multiple backends. So all of those neat tricks that Rob Graham talked about in his talk this morning, um, to handle 10 million connections at once, yep, we do that. It's all just a language. Rob speaks it too. Anything else? Yes. Yes, we actually do. <laughs> that was such a pain in the dick, but it works. <laughs> yes. We're, we're, so, so Dan Kaminsky actually challenged me, write an ASN1 parser in Hammer blind, like don't test it against anything and throw it against the Protoss test set. That's in the queue. I'll be doing that soon and like just publishing results and that one's going in the standard library. I'm sorry, I did Burr in Haskell, that sucked. <laughs> Somebody else? I, I, thought, I thought I saw another hand. Yo. Uh, so, well, with the Um so due to the nature of how IPv6 is designed, it is difficult to write a good parser for it. Um and for future protocols that are designed, we should keep that in mind. Um, this is not a reason to not use IPv6 
Um, this is just a reason to look a little bit closer at the parsers and give them a bit of extra testing. We'll, because, yes, they probably screwed it up at some level. Um, it's hard not to. Uh, we'll put the commented code um, from those vulnerabilities online and show exactly where uh, they got carried away with uh, passing semantic, in semantic information as an offset into a packet. So the fact that the particular chunk was aligned at the head of the MBUF uh, storing uh, the packet was actually meaningful for that function. And that semantic queue was misinterpreted and that led to uh, that uh, um, keep corruption. Uh, I mean, I, I would refer to the MBUF as, uh, to the MBUF storage as a, as a, a very customized uh, packet oriented heap. Uh, but uh, obviously that problem exists and it is going to uh, bite us in the ass it is going to be continuing. Uh, well, again, uh, you know, Vampire Finch, uh, actually, I mean, that's, that's blood on that beak, right? <laughs> um, that, um, I, I thought that, that the tool using Finch actually uh, talked it. But yeah, that problem will, will recur. If you're interested in looking at uh, I, uh, IPv6 text from this point of view, uh, we might give you some pointers where we think it's uh, really bad. Any more questions? All right, thank you all.